Last week, I went to an event hosted by the University of Waterloo for accepted students to their software engineering program. As I walked into the room, excited to see the people I would be spending the next four years with, there were 18 students already there, and all of them were male. Throughout the remainder of the event, I continued to be the only female student there. And while I never felt excluded, you do feel a little bit out of place, a little less likely to start a conversation or to join into a discussion. And as a female student competing in STEM, this is not an isolated incident. It's something you see everywhere, whether it's in a crowded lecture hall for a computer science competition, where there are only seven other girls, while writing a physics contest, or even in my AP calculus class. It's this kind of discrepancy that made us want to study both the causes and the effects of it, and that led to this project. Even when girls are given the opportunity to get involved in STEM through affirmative action programs or outreach programs, their experiences are often invalidated. This past summer, I was lucky enough to be able to attend a summer program for computer science at um, MIT. And even though it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, I learned so much and I felt really validated by being in an environment where I felt comfortable around STEM. When I came back and told other people about my experience, a lot of the time, the reaction was negative. They automatically assumed that because the program was a female program, it wasn't as competitive or as challenging as other similar programs. And what that did was it made me feel negatively about an experience that should have been a positive memory about STEM. At the same time, all three of us are students at the University of Toronto Schools, a school that admits equal numbers of girls and boys, at least in part based on STEM proficiency in the form of a math test. And because of this, a lot of people assume that UTS doesn't have a gender gap issue in STEM. In the grade seven classroom, there are equal numbers of girls and boys, um, and even though this is the case, uh, something that participation does not predict is either experience or performance. For these grade seven girls in the math class that are in equal numbers as boys, do they still have the same experience? Do they feel as good in, in the classroom? Do they raise their hand as much? Do they enjoy the class as much? And do they perform as well as their male counterparts? Do they, get as, uh, do, they do as well in math competitions? Do they go on to pursue careers in math? These are all questions that we wanted to address in our research. Our research question is, what social factors at our school contribute to a gender disparity in STEM competition results? We're studying this because we know that female students are participating in and succeeding in all of our standard courses, and that there's no inherent biological advantage for male students. But in those upper echelons of STEM competition, there's a huge gender disparity. Now, we know that um, gender is a spectrum, and also because um, it would be a huge generalization to say that all female students have had one experience and all male students have had another experience. But what we're noticing ultimately is that there is an ingrained preference for masculinity and male traits in STEM environments and an ingrained underestimation of femaleness and female traits. We began our study by looking at the STEM pipeline, so all the way from younger classes and younger students where there tends to be a bit more gender parity until STEM professionals, where women make up only about a quarter of the STEM workplace. We then found this 2010 study by Ellison and Swanson that showed the gender gap on both the SAT math and on the AMC 12, which is a very high level math competition. As you can see, although at lower percentiles, so at below average and average, female and male students perform about as well as each other, as you get to the highest percentile levels, the rate of females drops dramatically. For instance, at the 99th percentile level, only 14% of those achievers are female. And the top 46 students who wrote the contest were all male. We wanted to look at the fact that, A, this is not just due to participation rates, as for instance, on the SAT math, 100,000 stu more female students write it than male students. And for the AMC 12, although the rate is slightly smaller, it's not nearly enough to account for the 14% the 14 level. We also wanted to ignore theories of predisposition or innate ability because this has been discredited in multiple studies, showing that it is more of a societal factor that causes female students to underachieve. In addition, we wanted to study what it would be with different STEM fields. So while this study only looked at math, we have seen that the gender gap is closing much more quickly in areas such as biology than it is in others, such as computer science, where it's almost stagnating. 
And we wanted to study super elite schools. So although the boys in this study came from a wide variety of schools, all, um, over half of the female students came from only 20 super elite schools. Our school, UTS, as Amy mentioned earlier, could be considered one of those super elite schools. And we wanted to study what the gender gap would be like here. For if it exists strongly here, it must as well in many other areas. When we wanted, we wanted to look at a variety of different math contests um, over the past eight years and the honor rolls of all of these math contests and science contests to see how UTS students did in terms of gender discrepancy. The first type of contest that we wanted to look at were math contests, which at UTS are definitely the most common type of contest taken. What we saw was across the 12 different contests that we looked at, there was a really similar rate of female presence in the honor roll, around 30%. And this is especially troubling for contests like, for example, the Gauss Grade 7, which is mandatory for all students and therefore has equal participation rates of girls and boys. And yet, it still only had a 27% rate of female presence in the honor roll, suggesting a really large discrepancy even at such a young age. Uh, as Amanda was mentioning earlier, there are uh, differences among the different STEM fields. For example, for physics, um, over the past eight years, there have been 17 UTS students who have made the CAP exam honor roll. The CAP exam is a competitive physics um, contest in, throughout Canada. And out of those 17 students who made the honor roll, only one was a girl. Conversely, as we can see with biology, even though there is a little bit of a gender discrepancy, it's nowhere near as severe. For the top 170 competitors on the national biology competition, 45% were girls. However, another worrying trend that we see here is as we go up in percentile rankings, so as we look at the top 1% of competitors for the NBC, um, this number decreases to 41%. So at higher percentile levels, girls are doing worse, even in fields like biology, where there's pretty close to equal numbers of girls and boys. Another, another field that we could see this in was computer science. And for the computer science contest, we look at, looked at three main contests the junior CCC, the senior CCC, both of which are qualifying contests for the CCO or the Canadian Computing Olympiad. And what we saw here was already at the CCC level, the rate of female presence on the honor roll is extremely low. For the junior CCC, it was only 17%, and for the senior, it was even lower at 14%. But as we get to that highest level of competition, the Canadian Computing Olympiad, uh, we saw that rate dr uh, decrease dramatically. So over the past eight years, 14 UTS students have made the CCO honor roll. And out of those 14 students, zero were girls. What this really does is highlight what we're trying to say here today, which is that even at a school that's as competitive and interesting as UTS, that emits equal numbers of girls and boys and tries to give them the same type of education and the same tools to succeed in the STEM environment, we have such a large discrepancy. Misconceptions of what a, a, a female woman in STEM, of all the uh, female women in STEM, um, are common and they exist in a cycle. So prejudices are internalized and then they're taught. And we're not attributing any of this to the prejudice or misogyny of any individual. But again, it's a cycle. And we think that a lot of these preconceptions come from ideas of who a woman in STEM is. So who they are socially, what they look like, and what careers they might go into. And we do think that this changes the type of encouragement uh, that students are given. Um, we've identified a few different ways that we think are simple, but also can go a long, long way in terms of remedying this, um, this huge problem with disparity. So first of all, female role models. We think that um, uh, having a diverse group of female role models is really going to be important for, A, changing those preconceptions of what uh, different STEM careers are like and what people in STEM are like and what women in STEM are like. And also, there was a study done in 2012 that proves that women, actually female students, um, it's especially important for them to have role models and people that they can look up to. Now, second of all, talking about programs that are essentially affirmative action, like the ones that Amy did, um, that are, need to be distinguished and need to be recognized as just as competitive as their co-ed and male counterparts. And third, teaching methods. So there was actually a study done in 2015 by Simon et al. And in it, they talked about different teaching methods that are ideal for different types of students. Now, we know that in STEM environments, in most STEM cl classrooms, one thing that can be hugely advantageous to a student and a huge skill 
is the ability to just take a problem and not necessarily know at the beginning if you're able to figure it out, but be able to work through it and ultimately get to the end of it. Now, this is great, and this is absolutely a huge skill, but what about students who don't have that confidence right off the bat, that maybe would rather be shown how to do something first so that they can be confident that they know that that method can work, and then they're 100% able to complete it after that. So that's one of, the, one of those kinds of methods that if we're just more open to these kinds of um, different teaching methods and different ways that students like to learn and are comfortable learning, it's ultimately going to make STEM a much more inclusive environment. Because remember, ultimately we're learning in an environment that was designed with masculinity in mind, regardless of who exactly is participating in it and all of the prejudices of any specific person in it. Here, our goal is to make sure that anyone can walk into a STEM classroom and make sure that they don't feel excluded or isolated, but rather empowered and capable. Having more female students in STEM is going to create a positive feedback loop. Students of all genders are going to lead to leaders of all genders, and this, in turn, inspires the next generation. We really hope that this talk today has inspired initiatives towards meaningful gender equality, both at our school and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.